And we're back for another exciting episode of the Creators Collective. This is episode one one zero. Next one will be triple one. I'm looking forward to that. We'll do something fun for it. But yeah, let's skip that. Do something. <laughs> oh my! Fun. I've got double on here. I've got to clean this up. Huh? Ah. Wow! I completely Let's messed my own intro. <laughs> it's all right. I forgot to turn off my own video, and so I suddenly started hearing myself. Oh. <laughs> so welcome to the Creators Collective, and uh, we're going to have more fun today. I do want to say a huge thank you to our patrons on Patreon, a particularly Carib Harris, Carib Harris of You Can Make This Too, and Darren Mates. <laughs> it's like Caleb. 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 Caleb Hateless. Yes. If you'd like us to completely <laughs> botch your name, you can join the Patreon too. Uh, Patreon.com backslash Creators Collective. Uh, so yeah, today's just going to be a normal episode and the three of us are going to hang out and uh, talk through normal fun things. We haven't done a normal episode in a while. So uh, Zach, what you got going on? Uh, I knew you were going to do that. I actually didn't. <laughs> um, let's see. So I've been really active on Instagram lately. Um, it's just, I, I, I can't, I can't, we were just talking about this before. I can never remember anything beyond like the past 40 seconds. So I don't know what I said last week, but I've really been, um, I, I didn't realize it. So I posted that video. Did I post that video before last week? The one of forging that hammer for Jimmy? It was last week. Did I mention it already on the podcast? Okay. Well, anyway, I, I didn't realize until I put it out, but I, I'd been on like a four, it'd been four months since my last YouTube post, which, you know, every, every professional algorithm, blah, 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 tells you that that's the worst thing you can do for YouTube. I don't care. I don't care if it's the worst thing you can do for YouTube. It was the best thing I could do for myself. And I really needed uh, some time to really just, just do my thing out in the shop without cameras and lighting and editing and, you know, more blah, blah, blahs. So, um, yeah. And, and Instagram is God, it just, my, I have a, I have a pretty small, a relatively small following on Instagram, but I, I really, you know, I really enjoy it more because I can just do my thing and then, you know, pull my phone out of my pocket, take a picture, post it and carry on like, like nothing happened. Uh, so I've been, been doing a lot of that lately. Um, actually hit the, uh, recently hit the milestone hammer number 50. I put that up on my Instagram for auction and I was blown away when it, uh, the bid went up to $575 on that thing. Uh, wow. so yeah, it was crazy. I was, I was, I was blown away. So I threw in some, I, I felt guilty. So I threw in a lot of extra stuff, but, um, yeah, so that was that was neat. Uh, also just did a knife auction the other day on my Instagram. So, um, that's a sweet knife. Yeah. That's, so that's kind of like my, my zero with knife. I can't really say that it's like completely made by me. Cause that's kind of the one I learned on with, uh, Jake Palm, um, kind of guiding me. So it was kind of, he did some, I did some, he did some, I did some. Uh, so, you know, I, I kept the first one that I did by myself. I kept the second one that I did by myself. I have this one here. This is the third one, and it turned out very, very, very well. This is definitely the best one I've done. It is insanely sharp, so I'll probably auction this one off just because, um, man, knife making is it, it's it's a it's an it's an investment in time. It is not it is not a profitable um, industry to be in. I mean, I'm sure there's I'm sure obviously you can make it profitable, but compared to what I'm used to doing, be it, you know, hammers, fabrication projects, this, you know, any of that sort of thing. It is, you have three times the time invested into it and you get something, you know, that weighs like five ounces. So people aren't, you know, as generally people aren't, it's harder to justify the, all the labor that goes into something that's so small. And especially when you can go to, you know, a store and buy a similar shaped object for, you know, 20 bucks or 30 bucks. It makes it hard to justify all the time they put into it. But I feel you know, like that's the same as bowl turning. Yeah. I mean, you know, but fortunately, you know, we're speaking to the audience of our podcast who knows exactly how much effort goes into things. And I think any craft, you, you don't realize how much time and effort goes into it until you do it. Uh, but at least, at least even if it's not something that you're doing, at least you can understand like, Oh, I, you know, I, I guess I, 
I guess I didn't think about it, but yeah, there is a ton of work into that. So at least, you know, at least I feel like we, this community understands that and, and, and the value of, you know, handmade, uh, quality items. So, yeah. but yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's an expensive investment. I mean, making these things made a couple of them and I'm, uh, you know, I, I guess I'm really, I'm always inspired by things that I suck at. Um, <laughs> yeah. that's what I put my time into. Like if I, I can go out into the shop and if I make something and it looks great, I can shut down, you know, in two hours, three hours. I'm like, man, what a great day. I got this beautiful thing done. I'm shutting down shop. It's an early day and I'm just going to go inside and I'm happy. It was a success and I can revel in it for the rest of the day. If I go out into the shop to do something simple and I screw it up, I'll be out there all day, all night until I get it right. Cause it will drive me insane if I can't do something. And that's, I don't know if that's good or bad, but that's typically my inspiration, you know, behind doing things is I, I can't accept uh, failure. I can't, I can't accept it. I have to keep, you know, it'll, I'll drive myself crazy until I get it right. So uh, knife making is one of those things that everyone, at least for me, everyone's getting a little bit better, but still, you know, me looking at my own work, I'm like, God, why did I do that? I should have done it like this, or I should have, you know, so the reason that, uh, I'm probably going to be auctioning a lot of them off is because man, they're expensive. Like time wise, it's a huge investment. And my goal isn't necessarily to, to, to make these things for myself. It's just to make, to get, you know, to develop the skills to make these things. So, but not that I'm like turning knife maker full time or anything. I don't, I know for a fact that I don't want to do that. Um, but I do want to get good at it. And then I, you know, as soon as I'm good at it, I'll find something else that I suck at and I'll do that so Sweet. okay i'm done talking now <laughs> <laughs> well then will what you got oh man uh these stupid bar tops uh, uh yeah i i'm finishing up these bar tops i have the fourth and shortest bar top sitting in front of me glued up um they're all walnuts this one is 102 inches long so eight and a half feet long one before that was 106 inches long, 124 inches long, and the one before that was 150 inches long. Uh, so <laughs> just tossing these long boards around my shop, and they take up every like everything else done. Because once you glue up one of these tops, like that's your workshop, that's your bench, that's your everything. Um, so I'm excited to get these just kind of gone. I will bid them good riddance uh get paid and move on uh but i also uh i got that little honda ct70 trail bike up and running uh, and i posted a video on instagram and it is right uh i posted a video on instagram and facebook and people are like fun with it this thing is like i mean it's only wait. 72 cc's way to get to the mailbox what? Yeah, it's uh, it's 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 a lot of fun. So that was uh, that was pretty cool. It hadn't run in about twenty years. Uh, <laughs> really cool to see that thing running again. Um, what else am I working on? Oh, I started work on a knife display case for a client, um, and that's just going really, really well. Uh, I was love on paper turns into a project in reality with zero hiccups um, and just kind of everything is going according to plan. Uh, so that's a nice, neat little small project in total contrast to these big, you know, I can set it on a bench in the corner when I'm not working on it and it, I forget about it. It's yeah. not even there. <laughs> uh, uh, it's, it's so ridiculous. Uh, what else am I working on? Uh, um, that's it. Uh, just trying to get this stuff kind of knocked out and taken care of, and uh, yeah, just kind of a non exciting week except for the bike. But uh, what do you got going on, James? Well, uh, let's see. I made uh, Tuesday's live, I did a nap joint, uh, which is also known as a cove and pin dovetail or a crescent and pin dovetail. Oh, yeah, I saw that. That was pretty amazing. They're, uh, they, that thing well, looked insane. They're 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 
incredibly difficult to do with hand tools. Uh, well, they're originally basically the first uh, box joint or the first corner joint that you, you traditionally do dovetails. They were the first one that was ever made with power tools. And they were designed to have a router that would run around it. And so you have a jig that would support the router. Uh, well, they originally, the, the, it was on a router table. And so you would have a, a jig that you'd run the board across. Um, but they, they changed it so that a person with hand tools could make about 20 drawers in a day. Whereas with this joint on a power tool, they could make over 200 in a day. And uh, he patented it just after the Civil War. And so from late, uh, from like uh, 1880 until the turn of the century, it was very common to find these in drawers. And then after the turn of the century, they found a way to make dovetails with power tools. And they basically disappeared overnight. And so if you ever find an old piece of furniture with these joints in them, it's a great way of, of actually putting a date to the furniture because they were probably made between the Civil War and the turn of the century. But uh, yeah, I've, I've actually never, I've, I haven't found anyone online and I've been looking all over the place for someone else who's made them with hand tools uh, because they're, they just, they're incredibly difficult to do with hand tools. They're just this, this weird shape. Mm -hmm. um, so I figured it would be a, a good way to do it. So I did one of them in an hour live session Jeez. Um, on my channel. And circles I, are circles are hard always circles are very difficult well i mean circles are easy with with a, a bit and brace but the problem is that there's there's a pin in the middle of it and so you, you can't really get a chisel in to carve that deep recess around the circle yeah. it's a it's just yeah it was a really cool joint um and i'm looking for a project to put them into but i haven't found it yet uh, that was really really cool i didn't get a chance to watch the Lost like an hour and a half long. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I want to do a shorter but, video here soon and actually just, you know, do a how to video 10 minutes long, but not yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was nuts. Sorry. I totally interrupted. No, no. Uh, what else did I do? Oh, a coin maze. Um, I made a box. It's an invisible maze. So there's a maze inside the box. You can't see the maze. And you put a coin in on one side. And so you have to feel the coin going through the box to make your way through the maze to get the coin out the other side of the box. And uh, that was that was a fun one to make. It was probably about a two-hour project and something simple and fun to make for that puzzle in your life. But I think that's about all I have this week. Cool. What do you guys say we get into right. a couple questions? We actually don't have that many. Oh, we got a couple in the chat we'll throw in there. Um. We have one from Make Brooklyn. He submitted this one a couple weeks ago, and we just haven't had a chance to get around to it. Uh, perhaps a silly question, but why do you do what you do on the YouTubes, uh, apart from the millions of AdSense dollars, obviously? <laughs> I thought this would be kind of an interesting one because it, it kind of made me think, well, of course I do it because it's my job, but why actually do I do it? You guys have any idea? Uh, say it was... it is what introduced me to uh, community um, in, in making it. And it furthers my, uh, my skill set and kind of keeps me honest where if then I wasn't putting it out for the world to sort of judge, uh, then I, I honestly would probably take easier routes and I'd use a lot more pocket hole screws and things like that just to get things in and out. But um forces me to really evaluate my skill set and you know what what would make this project uh better stronger you know an heirloom piece uh it it for my you know my want to try new things um yeah that's a good question why do why do we put ourselves out there on YouTube? Are we just that self-centered? I don't know. <laughs> I do it for all the insane uh, notoriety that I get here in Newport, Ritchie, Florida. <laughs> um, you know, just mostly the fame, honestly, at this point. <laughs> uh, I, you know, it, it's really weird. Um, I think that's changed for me. I, I, I do. Mm -hmm. And at this point, you know, initially I, I got into it because I'm like, okay, I need to document my work so that I can use it as a resume and show people how much work 
goes into, I, I used it for, as a resume for potential clients and for current and past clients to be like, look, this is why, this is how much work goes into these things. And then it started like getting some attention and I started, then the, the networking took over. I'm like, this is really cool. This is fun. Like it's exciting to post a video and have people comment and get feedback because I have zero audience where I live. So it's nice to actually be able <laughs> yeah. to, you know, and, and, it, and it's exciting. And, and then the networking was the, the, that was kind of the next turning point where I'm like, wow, like now I'm like connected to a community that's super positive and, and great and everybody's helping each other. And that's, that's a huge part of it. And it still is. And then, um, you know, I'm to the point now, like to where this sounds terrible, but I don't really care. Like, I don't care about YouTube. Um, uh, I, I'm not saying it's not, you know, there, there aren't aspects that are enjoyable, but I, I really, I just want to build stuff. I just want to go out on the shop and make stuff. Um, that's, that's what I want. And YouTube is allowing me to do that. Um, so it's kind of a, you know, it's kind of an enabling thing, but that's kind of what I've been doing the past few months is experimenting and seeing, can I pay my bills, uh, you know, without YouTube money? And, uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> so, yeah. but I will say that, you know, I received some emails from people asking if I was dead and why, <laughs> why I quit making videos. And I, I get store, I get the occasional emails where, you know, from people that are saying that I inspired them to get into making. And that's pretty cool. Um, yeah. I'm not going to like give some sort of fake altruistic answer and say, God, you know, I just, I just do it for the, the community and I just do it for this <laughs> and that. Cause that's a part of it, you know, certainly, but, uh, I do it for me because I like making stuff and, uh, YouTube is a part of my, my, it's become a part of my income. It's become a part of me getting networked. It's really been, it's been a, uh, a co-factor in my, my success. So, uh, that, that's probably the biggest part of it. If I could, if, if I were given the option to have the exact same income, uh, and not that I make much from YouTube, by the way, most of my money comes from my stuff, but you know, if I could not have to record video and not have to edit video and that wouldn't change anything, I would totally take that. I would not do any of that. <laughs> so I, I don't enjoy, I mean, it's, it's not terrible, but given the choice between doing that or you know, staying in the zone in the shop. That's what I would rather do. So, um, yeah, I, I hope See, I that... Think that go ahead. I think that's totally funny. Uh, I mean, I've got a totally different background, uh, than, than you, you know, I'm, I'm in the creative professional field. Um, and I hate that term, especially when I'm talking to people, you know, that are making things with their hands. Um, when you professional, that's a term that you kind of use for photographer, videographer, animator, um, you know, but you, that's not to say that you're not a creative professional in your work. You're not, you know, cause you obviously you're using your creativity and your skill set to make things, but I, I got off on a tangent there, but, um, as someone who is kind of from the world of photo and video, like I, I love the video making process. Like I like to turn a thing and like rip it all down, think it's totally crap, re-edit the video and like make a cohesive story from beginning to end. Like I just, I love that, but that's also just me. <laughs> yeah. I actually, I think I do it for the comments. Um, uh, that is that is what drives my day is uh, is the the comment list. That's why I I respond to almost every single comment that has ever been posted on any of my videos, and that's um, a lot of comments. <laughs> huh. I, I, uh, I I love them. That, that's I, I like, think that's one of my big reasons. I like the the negative trolley ones. Oh yeah, I I don't get that many. I get oh, like I, one I, a I, month that are just like total snarky. Um, I think. I love those. Those I are phenomenal. I think I said that a few podcasts ago, and now I'm getting like more more trolley comments. Like I just <laughs> got one on the the tool handles thing, and it was so I, I don't know. I, I laughed, and it made me unpin like Jimmy Duresta's comment and pin it up at the top. Like pinning <laughs> pinning the worst comments at the top yes. is my favorite thing to do because then 
then I get to see people's responses to the terrible yeah. comments, which oftentimes are better than the terrible comments themselves. So I don't know. It's it, 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 I, it's fun. <laughs> that many snarky comments. I get a lot of people that tell me how they would have designed a piece differently or used different materials or and just kind of like, yeah, you would have made a totally different table than I made. Awesome. Yeah. Good, good, cool story. Yeah, that's the one I've, I've never quite understood is why people feel that the comment session is the point at which they would say, I would do it differently. Well, we all yeah. know you would do it differently because you're a different person. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Uh, uh, do we have any other questions? I thought we had one in the comments today. There were a few in the comments. No, oh, let's, let's do them. All right. Um, what is the see. most satisfying the thing most... you've made? Mm. Uh, practically doesn't matter. This is from Jeff Gruff. Doesn't matter. You guys? Uh, nobody, nobody. Nothing. Did I cut out <laughs> dead air? Am I not funny? No. Yeah. What did you? What did you say? I said you guys have hey, children, exactly. right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, missed it. Uh Making the children was very satisfying. I think for me, it's the table. That has been the most... Um, and it's still, I mean, like a lot of other big pieces of furniture, a month or two afterwards, they're kind of like, oh yeah, I made that. It's cool. But this, I'm still sitting at the table every day and I'm looking at it and just my jaw is, is still on the floor. Um, I, I'm, yeah, in, I'm in love I can with imagine that. There's just so, so many little intrigues me, that I get to see new things. So for me, I think, so all of my like most, I don't know, adventurous projects, my, you know, they took a lot of skill. They took a lot of, you know, were, were commissions for other people. So I don't get to sit there and look at them every day. Like I'm super proud of them. Um, but like they, I, I mean, okay, bye. <laughs> and I took the money and put it in my bank account. But uh, I, I don't know. I guess my house, does that count? I made my house. Oh, I yeah. built my house. And I yeah. get to live in that every day in my shop. Yeah. yeah. What about you, Zach? I'm going to go with house. Um, I, you know, I think the the common thread is, is that uh, whenever I do something I've never done before or the, the more in, you know, the, the more risky or the more intimidating the project, the better the payoff is when you mm -hmm. finish it. So I think it's, I don't know if I can pick a favorite, but some of the ones that stand out to me, like uh, that industrial desk was a big one because I had to like make the drawers for it, like bend the metal and make the drawers and deal like weld on, runners and stuff just uh, t there's just a lot of things that i'd never done before in that project and it was big and it was heavy and it was uh you know it was it was, it was an intimidating project so that the reward was good and also you know the sculpture the big the big sculpture oh, I did the was, was, pyramid was base one. yeah because that was the you know that was a hundred percent my design um I mean, some people think I ripped off the perfect circle logo, um, but you know, circles have been around for a long time, and a lot of people have used the logos. Um, are you going to trademark the uh, circle? Very, like most circles, look kind of like other circles. Yeah. So I don't know, but uh, so yeah, that uh, you know, that was a first for me, and just just you know, coming up with the especially when it's like something abstract for a client. It's like, you have no idea uh, if, if they're going to like it. It was a lot of new skills and uh, it, I think it turned out really well. Um, and, you know, just, I, I get the same thrill from anything that's new. As soon as something becomes like redundant and repetitive, I, it's no longer rewarding for me. So like the other day I forged, um, so there's this, this Facebook group called weekly blacksmith challenges that I found. And, uh, it's exactly what it sounds like. There's a contest every week to forge something and whoever wins that gets to pick the challenge for the next week. Um, so I've done like two or three so far and 
one of them was to forge like this weird horse head bottle opener slash meat turner. I don't know. It's like a griller's Swiss army. Tool. I, I don't know. I don't, I don't get it, but whatever. It was a challenge. And uh, so that was my first time like doing like a head, like a horse head or a, you know, that's anything fancy for a mm-hmm. bottle opener. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't excited about it and I did it. And I'm like, well, it's a skill builder. So it doesn't matter if I'm excited about it. The idea is to, to do things that you've never done before. And, uh, it came out okay. The first one I did looked a lot more like Joe Camel than a horse. Like it's like this smug. There's a picture of it on my Instagram. Like it's this smug, weird, skinny necked camel looking thing. But then the next day, that hammer auction ended, and I I don't know if it's I I'm I'm always scared to use the word ironically now because there's always that one person that's like that's not ironic. That's coincidental. So um, coincidentally or ironically, <laughs> I don't know which one it is. Um, the person who bought won the hammer auction is from my hometown, Spokane, Washington. And he's like a rancher. He go to his Instagram profile and there's just like all these amazing pictures of uh, horses. And I was like, wow, that's strange. I just kind of forged a camel yesterday. <laughs> so, uh, so I kind of took my second crack at it and I really think I nailed it. Um, yeah. That so one forged, cool. Yeah. So I forged I like that. the little frill work around the opener. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Uh, that's like, so I've, I've been kind of into like art deco stuff. So I wanted to like incorporate some sort of art deco ish patterning around the, the actual bottle opener thing. But, uh, yeah, I'm really happy with the way that came out. So it, even though it's like a, you know, compared to some of my big multi day, multi week projects, like this little thing that took me two iterations and, you know, maybe two hours to forge like I got almost the same amount of satisfaction because at the end I looked at it and I'm like holy crap I made this and that's that's like the you know what do they what do heroin addicts call it like chasing the dragon's tail or something like that (laughs) um I grew up in Spokane so I know all of these things yeah um and now I'm in Newport Ritchie so but uh yeah I don't know I mean just just whenever you have something finished and you look at it and you're proud Mm -hmm. and you can say like, I didn't think I could do that. Like that's, that's what, you know, that's, that's the, the, the best part, I think. Cool. Well, we do have one other question and this is kind of a two parter uh, from Tommy Hubbington. Uh, What do you guys plan to do in 2019? And then make Brooklyn added on top of that. Um, Pulling on to Tommy's question. What what new things do you plan to learn in the coming year? How do you plan to step out of your comfort zone? I think we can also throw Sean Sturgis into that question with uh, what is on your bucket list of projects. You know, kind of start with what's on your bucket list, what's your plan for 2019, and what skills are you do you want to? Mm-hmm. So, what, how about you, James? You never get to answer first. Um, I think the I really don't want to do any big furniture this year. I want to do a bunch of smaller things. I want to do a whole bunch of shelves and uh, uh, normal like end table type size projects. And so that, that's my big goal this year is not to do anything large, but to do five or six decent little furniture projects. Um, so I think that's my my biggest thing. Is I, I normally either do like the the projects that take three or four hours in the shop or the projects that take an entire year. <laughs> and doing that in between is, is not my, my comfort zone. Um, yeah. Uh, so for me, and I'm actually glad that Tommy was the one that asked this, um, but I am gearing up for the acoustic guitar build. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So I might start with something small like a ukulele or uh, something similar like that that doesn't need a truss rod. Um, but yeah, the I've been actually messaging with Tommy a lot. Uh, just, uh, you know, just trying to wrap my head around it. You know, gather materials, things like that. I actually got two books for Christmas on uh, making acoustic. One is who made it? Uh, Tom, uh, Kincaid. He's a guitar maker. He's I can't famous. remember his first name. The, there's that one, but a different, different Kincaid guitars guy. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so that's that's that. Um, I'm trying to get more efficient in my shop, get projects in and out quicker. 
um, to make more money, try to stay focused uh, and kind of step, not to step back from the art, but get with the art instead of, you know, doing five projects a year, maybe do 20 projects a year. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, Jonathan seen, Kincaid, thank you, Tommy. Have you ever seen Thomas Kincaid toilet paper? No. no, but that sounds awesome. <laughs> if the the tagline is "Put the painter of light where the sun don't shine," <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. Uh, that's great. Uh, what about you, Zach? Uh, what you got? Uh, uh, what are, what are, oh, what are your plans what, for the year? Um, moving. I went and got boxes <laughs> yesterday from uh, Home Depot because we're we're. Oh wow! You know, like. We, I don't know, man. I, uh, like so stressful. Like, so th they sure don't make it easy for anybody to buy a house. Um, you know, we have, we have a good chunk of money in savings. I think that, you know, my, my wife is a breadwinner. I, I do. Okay. I don't make a ton of money. Um, my, my wife makes like three times what I make. Um, and God, housing prices are insane. Yeah. Like I know there, they're going to, they're, they're going to explode as soon as, as soon as we buy a house, the damn market's going to crash. I know it. I know it's going to happen. Uh, I, I just feel it. And you know, you look at all these houses on like Zillow and realtor.com and you see that like, uh, you know, they were purchased like six years ago for like a quarter of the price. And it just, just infuriating, infur infuriating. <laughs> and, uh, I can't even say it. So yeah, we're, you know, there's a few places I found one up in, uh, ferndale up by bellingham that has i mean it's like a the house is not great it's like a manufactured home but man it has like this huge tons of acreage gigantic insulated powered shop all this stuff it's really <laughs> exciting uh but the, the trick is is you know i'm finding out that none of my income matters yeah my uh because and none of my credit i have really good credit um but my wife my wife's credit isn't as good, although she makes more money. So mine's completely like pretty much irrelevant because they go by who has the lowest credit. And um, yeah, and we bought our house. It went on my wife's. So the house belongs to my wife and I'm not even on the title <laughs> because I didn't make any money and my business is actually in the negative at the time. Yeah. So I'm a maker because yeah. I'm a maker. My wife bought the house. And I'm not on the title because I'm yeah. a maker. Uh, <laughs> um. Yeah, it's just really stressful. So my income doesn't count at all because I started this business, you know, two years ago and almost <clears throat> almost all of my income is an expense for materials and supplies. Uh, so my my net income was like ten thousand dollars last year for 2018. Mm -hmm. um, I don't feel like it was ten thousand dollars because I put, you know, all of the literally all of the money I made right back into the things uh you know for my shop and materials and supplies and all of that so uh, but yeah it makes it really difficult to apply for a house when your net income is ten thousand dollars <laughs> so uh but yeah i don't know my, my wife that's probably going to be all her but it's it's just a frustrating process and you know you have to talk to tons of people who all tell you different things and I see i find it enjoyable but i've moved 25 times so it's Jesus. it's a did you own every time? Um, quite a few of them. Hmm. Yeah. That's like 20% down. That's insane. <laughs> it's crazy. James probably made all his own money too. Like literally like, you know, yeah, I started a mint. <laughs> uh, oh, uh, well, let's, yeah. let's look at the Peter's photo challenge because we haven't done this one in a while. And we had the challenge for Boca. And this has actually been running for almost a month now. So we have a, a good selection of pictures. Uh, so if you don't know what the Critters Photo Challenge is, we normally do it every other week or so. And it is on Instagram. And so if you just put up a picture that fits the criteria for that event and then tag it with the hashtag Creators Photo Challenge, then we will judge you and pick it. And whoever wins actually wins a prize from one of the three of us. So what are they winning this week? Whose turn is it? Well, I uh, was the last prize giver, um, and that was Frog Legs. And I actually turned him this uh, little uh, black locust 
bowl dish, mise in place bowl. I don't know what you call it. Cool. Um, small bowl. Shipping out today, Frog Legs, if you're listening. Um, so it's one of you guys. Uh, you know what? I have a couple extra strops left, so I'm going to throw a strop. Oh, in this cool. Week. I was going to say, I have some cool. shirts, That's a good. I'd rather have a strop than a sh- one of my shirts, so have at it. <laughs> <laughs> cool. sure so I, sure today the audience will get a strop. Uh, so let's go through the list. Uh, Zach, who is your pick? Um, well, I, I have two picks, like always. Um, McAllister <laughs> Home. And, oh, wait. Yeah, McAllister Home, but actually I read that out of order. My favorite goes to Gruff's Workshop. Uh, it's just a simple picture. has, you know, it's some some nails, and it's just a really, just a really well. Oh, that line clean, of nails? Yeah, so it's, just a, a, it's just simple and and good. <laughs> so, uh, uh, For those of you listening, there are a line of nails, and there are like one or two that are focused in the middle, and the ones out farther and back are completely out of focus so oh yeah i shot yeah it's a uh, rat it's a couple of racks of uh I oh yeah uh, um, no he just spent a lot of time stacking up all those nails in perfect order <laughs> <laughs> good on him uh that is my first choice second choice is tom from McAllister home and uh yeah cutting some wood with a ball gouge and some uh really selective focus there it looks good the lights in the background of that are the, the, the perfect circle that you expect with the um bokeh very gorgeous yeah he he nailed that uh the challenge of, of bokeh i think mean, there's like a perfect example of it what about you will i gotta go with Mac- McAllister home uh that i mean it was the perfect image for the challenge uh, it was just a cool photo too but it just it was perfect um so McAllister home and then you know what i'm gonna throw one back back at us uh zach's blacksmith rose um almost didn't make it into the challenge because he didn't tag it uh but <laughs> <laughs> but he told me about it so i went and looked and looked for it uh and it was it was just a, a good great photo dude thanks sweet so Somebody yeah. should have done that. Uh, oh, go ahead. I'm going to have to... My first pick is uh, Hatchet... Ha- hatch made it? Yeah, Hatch, hatch made, made it. 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 Um, he he's, the guy that, he's the guy that sent us all the birch. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. We need to do something Ky- like that here. Kyle soon. Hatch? I still have it. It's all wrapped up. Yeah, mine, I, yep, mine is getting this really nice do. spalting from the moisture inside the wrapping, so I'm really looking forward to cutting into that. Um. But yeah, he had a, a picture of this bud in grass, and it's all covered in frost. Uh, just a, a really cool shot. Uh, almost looks like it's a, um, a weathered picture, but the bright red of the bud pops out. Um, really beautiful. So that was that was my first pick. And my second pick is uh, McAllister Home as well uh, with the ball gouge, just because that is the iconic, perfect frost shot, uh, um, bokeh shot. So, well, I think he he, he got the trifecta. Winner. So, yeah. yes, um, Michaelis Rome. If you contact me, um, send me a message on Instagram or through my email, and I'll get you out a strop. I That's think good because have... he has enough of my shirts. I <laughs> need more of my shirts. <laughs> yeah, I have Some, I, I have a couple have strops left, um, but now all my strops are actually on back order. So I'm going to be doing a run the end of this month. So if anyone wants to order them. Uh, because the first two runs I had sold out almost instantly. I have them on my channel now, so you can uh, pre-order them for that load. Somebody should have done a key, a bokeh key. <laughs> so do we have a uh, um, a challenge for next week or two weeks from now? Uh, so you had said something about motion? Yeah, I right? was suggesting maybe? motion. Does that sound like a good one? Yeah, so maybe some motion blur or just uh, the... Implicate, uh, uh, inferred Im- implication, motion. inferred motion. Yeah. Cool. So two uh, weeks motion movement, uh, in two weeks, we'll be doing this again and get in your Instagram posts and you too can win something from Zach this time. So, uh, looking forward to that. Uh, we yeah, do probably a knife. <laughs> uh, you yeah, probably not. But... <laughs> oh, something else that I should mention because I keep forgetting. Um, I'm going to take a second here and advertise for myself because I can. 
You guys see the duck hammer? This weird experimental hammer that says quack on the back of it because I thought it was like a duck, <laughs> so I stamped a quack on it. Um, so I wanted to do something for my Patreons because I'm bad at that. You guys support me and I don't do anything for you. So um, what I'm going to start doing is every month during the the Patreon hangouts that I do, I'm going to start like just raffling off an item. So this month it's going to be that hammer. So anybody who is a Patreon supporter of mine, um, every dollar that is donated is good for one ticket. So obviously the, the, the more money you, you contribute, the, the more chance you have to win, but I'm going to just start doing that every month. So cool. Yeah. Well, we have a right. joke of the week and this one is from Jeff Gruff. Uh, this is sent a while ago because we actually have a list of them to go through. But uh, a new study was found that humans actually eat far more bananas than monkeys. But I can't remember the last time I ate a monkey. <laughs> oh. oh, man. Yes, thank you for that, Jeff. If you have a joke you'd like to see on the podcast, feel free to send it one of us and we'll add it to the list. <laughs> the, the worse they are, the better. <laughs> Uh, cool. That's really bad. Let's do uh, what we're watching, reading. Uh, Will, what you got? All right, so I've got a good controversial one. Uh, <laughs> yeah, a few weeks ago, a uh, few weeks ago, Samurai Carpenter Jesse, uh, I love you, dude, but uh, put out a video on exposing the myth of wood movement about how people pay too much attention to building things uh, to account for wood movement and that he's never had any of his projects explode. Uh, but he failed to take into account uh, anyone that lives anywhere else in the world. Uh, I guess he lives in Victoria, British Columbia, and it has a pretty, uh, pretty, I don't know, flat-lined relative humidity throughout the year, but but he didn't take into account like the MF or the Midwest or the North. Or people uh, don't have an, Northeast. an AC house. Yeah, or people that don't have an air conditioned house, like in California. Um uh yeah, it was just uh totally wrong. Like I've had pieces explode due to wood, wood movement. Um I've known so many other people, I've seen so many antiques that they built with breadboard ends for that purpose. And then you come back to that piece later and you, the, the, the top or the panel had shrunk um, yeah. in relation to the breadboard ends, um, you know, cause they did it the right way. Uh, but yeah, that's what I, that's what I was watching. And I thought you might have something to say about that, that James and maybe you too, Zach, I know you don't do a whole lot of work with specifically just wood, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, well, if, you, I if that... you build something for inside in an air-conditioned house and it's going to be there for the rest of its life, it's not something you have to worry as much about. But if there's any potential for it to be open, like I used to live in northern Michigan um, and we didn't have air conditioning in our house. In the winter, it would get down to, you know, negative 20, negative 30. And in the summer, there would be a couple weeks out of the year where it would be 70, 80. Um, so that's why we just didn't have any air conditioning. But those couple weeks out of the year would be incredibly humid. We were on Lake Michigan. And so any wood in the house would absorb an incredible amount of moisture and then in the winter go down to 0% humidity for months on end and dry out to like 4 or 3% wood moisture. Um, and then the next year expand rapidly. And so we would have, you know, wood movement on a tabletop could be as much as, you know, a, a quarter inch to uh, uh, three eighths of an inch total. Um, mm -hmm. And that is a significant amount of movement <laughs> that, yes, it, it can happen. But, I mean, for the average person making small things, I think that the, the propensity in most woodworkers is to over overemphasize wood movement. And it's very easy to make it far bigger of a deal than it is. And I think he did a good job of pointing that out. I think, uh, I think he just may have knee kicked a little too far. Yeah, I think I think that's kind of the my, I mean, I've done a, quite a few tables and stuff and, um, yeah, I, I guess I haven't really seen much of an issue. I've had one where the, it moved just enough to where like the, the finish on it had like a slight blem, like a little micro crack where the, the expansion was right on the end. Um, so it, it, I mean, it does move, but I feel like that's, I feel like it's one of those things that people love calling other people out on. Yeah. Yeah. Like, even if they do account for it, they're like, 
oh, you didn't account for enough wood. That thing's going to move. That's going to explode. And there's always like these, yeah. these ridiculous adjectives. Like it's going to explode. Like they used to use them in World War II as like improvised explosive devices. It's like throw throw pocket hole joinery behind enemy lines and run for cover. Uh, <laughs> it's not going to happen. So that's my take. Yeah. Cool. Well, I actually have to give a shout out to someone who is in our uh, in our audience tonight, um, Tommy Huffington. Uh, he put up a video in collaboration with uh, Le Pic Bois and, uh, oh, I can't remember the name of the other channel, uh, but they made a, a live YouTube uh, uh, counter uh, for uh, counting oh, yeah. subscribers. Um, and I really, really liked how that came out. Um, just beautiful job and so i immediately went out and uh and, and purchased um several sets so i can make a couple different ones for a couple different channels i have be funny so. if they they put it up and like as soon as they publish the video it starts going down <laughs> <laughs> actually the pic did that on his oh did he his, i haven't seen it yet yeah but he yeah. was uh, went up one he smiles it went down one he fries. that guy's that guy's hilarious oh yeah he uh he is I, he's I intense just, i posted the uh I got my silver play button in the mail the other day and I posted a picture of me like in the reflection of it <laughs> and he edited it, put his, his face in it and changed the numbers. It was funny. <laughs> <laughs> the woodpecker. Yeah. Cool. What you got, Zach? Uh, um, we do I'm guessing a, a book following. Yes, it is a book. Uh, yeah, uh, da, 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 da. I just finished a book that I don't like. Um, it's it's another one of those Don Norman books. Um, I'm not saying it's not valuable. Info. I think I talked about this last week. It's the he's the guy that did um, do, 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 I don't know all these books on design that are really more about psychology than design. <laughs> the the one that I just finished is called Emotional Design, and the first one was called Design of Everyday Things. Um, and I know a lot of people really like that book, but I feel like he talks about design for in both books for about like. 30% of the book, then he goes into psychology and then he goes off the deep end about robots. I think the man loves robots. <laughs> so um, it's kind of weird for a design book. It's not really what I had in mind. I'm going to give those away because I'm thinning out my book collection because I don't want to haul all that stuff across the country. Yes. So if you really want to read those books, uh, send me a message and I'll send them to you. Uh, let's see. Cool. Oh, I haven't even answered the question yet. Uh, so I started reading a book called the history of graphic design volume one, and it is a gigantic book. Um, Oh, I already posted it. Yeah. And it's uh, exactly what it, what it says. So it's, it's, this one goes from, I can't remember, but it's, you know, probably like the 1700s or so or 1800s up through 1950. And there's volume two that I don't have, but it covers, uh, you know, a lot of the, the, the movements in, in art and, you know, uh, also design cause they're all, they're kind of symbiotic. Um, but a lot of like posters and you can kind of see the evolution of, um, letter press and, uh, uh lith lithography. So you can just, it's kind of a cool, you know, I've read books on the kind of how art has progressed and changed and all the different movements, but it's kind of nice, nice to read this because it's more of the same thing, but kind of a graphical representation of how design has changed over time. So cool. Well, do you have a product of the week, Zach? Man, back to back. <laughs> what you got, Will? <laughs> uh, so I got to go with uh, Permatex. Um, it's a uh, kind of a liquid gasket maker. And I was working on this uh, little trail bike with my father-in-law and he was only here for a short bit of time. And there's a gasket that was in pretty bad shape and he was gets, uh, we, we can order them and get them here in time for him to still work on them. Um, because I'm pretty mechanically illiterate. Uh, I was mechanically illiterate. Now uh, I had a pretty good education from him on this bike and they're like, Oh, yeah, I get engines now. Um, not to say I'm a mechanic, but uh, so we use this stuff, Permatex, um, to make a new gasket, and uh, it, it worked great. And we got, you know, great compression out of the. So Permatex, it's a good 
good in a pinch thing. Cool. Pun intended or yeah. no pun intended? <laughs> uh, wasn't pun intended, but now it is. Uh, what about you, Zach? Uh, purpose. Got it. Oh, I wrote it down. Uh, I'm going to go with Uline, and not because I've ever purchased anything from them that I know of, but if you sign up for their mail catalogs, this they'll send or like register on their site. They send you these gigantic like half telephone book yeah. uh, magazines. Mm -hmm. And this is actually what I, I, I ironically or coincidentally, I don't know. Uh, somebody let me know. Uh, but so this is actually the, sure they the, the free catalogs that they send are actually what I use for my packing material. I just rip the pages straight <laughs> off of this, and um, yeah, I think that's you, ironic. You can, yeah, they send them, they send them to you like once a month, and they're huge. And uh, yeah, I, I, it's almost perfect with the amount of stuff I send out. I usually go through about one free uh, packing catalog per month to pack my my boxes with. So yeah, register. You don't need to buy anything. They'll send you a catalog. Use it. But Uline is also great for. Anything you have any sort of they are, but man, the shipping is insane. I almost ordered, uh, there's like some bags that I was gonna order. Their prices on their products are really good, but they're one of those companies where, like, you're like, oh wow, what a great price! And you fill out three pages of your information, and then you go to click buy, and it's like shipping $80 for like you know a tiny box of stuff. I think, I think if you're ordering, I think it makes sense if you're ordering huge quantities of things. Uh, if, if you need like less than 200 of something, it's cheaper somewhere else. Cause shipping's brutal. Well, uh, for me, I have to go with, uh, tungsten weights. Um, I, I, I'm working with my kids right now, making their, uh, boy scout pinewood derby cars and all three of them are making one and they are the perfect weight. The ones I chose are actually designed for fidget spinners. But if you've ever played with tungsten weights, they just feel weird. Um, and they're just fun to have on, the, on the, the desk. And so I have a few of them here that I mess around with. And uh, yeah, I love them. They feel good. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Uh, I think that about does it for this week. Do we have anything else we need to mention? No. Uh, next don't... week, we are going to have a special so. guest on. Uh, we'll actually be talking to my brother, who is um, he is a voice uh, voiceover recorder. So he does uh, uh, voices for books and uh, and uh, games and things like that. So it should be kind of interesting to see a maker from a different point of view. But uh, yeah, join us next week. Uh, we record every Thursday at 10 a.m. Eastern time, and we do that on YouTube. You can find us, the Creators Collective, on YouTube. Join the live chat and have your questions answered on air. So I think that's it. And until next time, have a wonderful day. See you later. Adios.